Hi everybody, I'm Stuart Hillard. Welcome back to my latest AccuQuilt and Create and Craft Quilting Classroom. Today, I'm going to be showing you what we call a block on board. Now, this is a concept, a brilliant concept that AccuQuilt came up with to put everything that you need to create a classic or modern quilt block on one die. So rather than having to search around through your collection, you can literally grab one die and go. And the die that we're going to be using today is probably one of my all-time favorite quilt blocks ever. And it's the Dresden plate. There's something about the Dresden plate block which is just timeless. It's classic, it's old-timey, it's modern, it's fresh. It doesn't matter what kind of fabric you throw at it, whether you do scrappy version, oriental fabrics, batik, solids, you name it, Christmas, it all seems to work. It all seems to suit this fantastic block. And, and there are loads of different options as well in the Dresden plate. So I know it's one that you're going to enjoy and love. So we've got some great demonstrations for you um, in this quilting classroom. I want you to have a look first of all at this cushion that I've got next to me. This is the one that I'm going to reference quite a lot throughout the classroom. This is a single block. Now my top tip, absolute top tip for quilters, is if you've any intention of making a quilt, make a block first. Make the block start to finish. Make sure you love it, you enjoy the process, you understand the process and you're comfortable with it before you commit to doing a whole quilt. So a, a cushion is a great first project. If you get fed up of cushions, you could always make a table runner or a placemat or something else, but it's always good to do one single block. So this uses one of the Dresden plate options. I've also added a few little extras that I'm going to show you how to do in the classroom today as well, including these really cute little three-dimensional points that I've added around the plate. Now, if you have a look at the quilt behind me, this is one that Joan, my lovely friend Joan made, a Dresden plate for Christmas. Isn't that a gorgeous quilt with all her favourite Christmas prints, golds and greens and reds, and it's just such a beautiful block. And doesn't it look completely different? And they both really work. So let's start by having a look at the actual die that you get. Now this is a larger die, so first off, this won't go through the Go Baby, all right? But if you've got the Go or the Go Big, this will go through both of those machines. It's a 10 inch by 24 inch die, so you'll also need the 10 by 24 cutting mat. Now you've probably already got that mat for your two and a half inch strip die, Every quilter needs that die. But if you don't, make sure you pop that 10 by 24 cutting mat into your basket when you're purchasing your Dresden plate die. Now, you'll see that there are various different cuts on this one die. Let's start by talking about the circles down the end. I mean, how useful are circles? They're essential for the Dresden plate block, but they're also really useful for things like faux drunkard's path, for appliques, for flowers, for embellishments. So really useful to have. Then in the center, you've got your straight-ended blades. Now we can use these blades for creating a Dresden plate that has a, a, an almost circular appear. It's a smooth outer edge. But we also use this same blade for creating the pointed blades, which you saw on both my cushion and also Joan's Christmas quilt. So that one is probably my favourite, but that's not all. We've also got the rounded end blades. Now on these blades, you've got this curved end. And that works in exactly the same way as the pointed or straight-ended blades. And you can actually mix and match the blades together. So there are even more options. Do you also notice on the blades that there are these little um, points here that help us to match up our blades? They're called notches. There's something that's used a lot in dressmaking. 
but AccuQuill also include them on some of their dies to help your accuracy when you come to match up your pieces. So another reason to uh, use your AccuQuilt dies. We can cut up to six layers. We're going to need to cut 20 blades per block, which means we need five layers of fabric, and then we can cut out a whole block in just one cut. Now, if you wanna mix and match your fabrics a little bit more, you can do more than one cut, and that's what I'm gonna be doing. So first of all, I've got my fabrics pre-prepared and I've cut some rectangles of fabric. These are big enough to cover the blades that I want to cut, all right? Now, always make sure that when you're doing your cuts that you have the selvage on your fabric running through the length of your die. So that selvage that printed edge should run north to south. If the selvage isn't on your fabric, then you can always do what I like to call the snap test. So you can give your fabric a little tug and one way, the sound is quite dull and there's quite a lot of bounce. That's the crosswise grain. We want the lengthwise grain. If we tug on the other direction, listen, do you hear how much tighter, how much higher that sound is? That's because the grain is much more stable and that's what we want. We want that most stable lengthwise grain going through the length of your machine. So either way, lengthwise grain please. Cover the shapes that you want to cut up to six layers. So I've got four layers there for now because I've got eight layers to cut in total and I've got my cutting mat on top. Now, as I mentioned, you're going to need either your go cutter or your go big. I've got my go cutter. And I've put my 10 by 24 cutting mat on top. You know, one of the things I love about AccuQuilt is that I can do my cutting sitting down. I don't even have to stand up. So if uh, that's an issue for you, AccuQuilt's a great system. One pass is all it takes. All those blades are cut now. So out the other side, slide your mat off. And then we can just remove the excess fabric from around the outside edge. There are all my blades cut out. So I'll keep them in those stacks and place them to one side. And now I'm also gonna cut my blue fabrics. So I've got those right here. So again, I'm going to do four layers. Remember, you can cut up to six, making sure that the lengthwise grain is going through the length of your machine. Pop your cutting mat on top. And then again, wind through. It doesn't matter whether you're winding away from yourself or whether you wind towards yourself, whether you're right or left-handed. The cuts are just the same, perfect every time. So that's done. Slide the mat off the top. We can get rid of that now. And then remove the excess fabric from the outer edges. And there we go. All cut out. Now, while I'm here and I'm doing some cutting, I am also going to cut the circle for the centre. Now, I'm going to show you a technique here. There's a reason why there are two circles on the die board, and it's not just to increase the number of shapes you can cut. Because for every one Dresden plate block, we actually need two circles. How come? Well, we're going to use two circles together stitched through in a turned applique method. All will become clear. All you need to know right now is that you need to cut out two circles for the center of your Dresden plate block. So I'm gonna cover those two circles with one layer of fabric, grab my cutting mat, and do that final cut. So that's my circles cut out. 
I do think circles are probably the hardest shape to cut out accurately with a pair of scissors, which is why I don't bother anymore. There we go. Cutting that off. And I've got a couple of perfect circles cut out in next to no time. All right, so all my cutting is done for one full block. That didn't take long at all. So I can get rid of the machine. Next job, we need our ironing surface and an iron. Okay, because what we're going to do next is we're going to create those pointed ends. So for one Dresden plate block, you're going to need 20 blade shapes. So I'm using four different fabrics, so that means I need five of each. So I'm just gonna get them all laid out ready. I've got two different pink fabrics and two different blue fabrics that are gonna go together really beautifully. But you could be doing a scrappy version and just using you know, a different fabric for every single blade, and that would also work really well. You could also just use five of these blades and create a quarter fan, a Dresden fan, or you could use 10 of them and create a half fan. So it's very versatile. Three quarters of them would create lovely interlocking fan shapes. I mean, there's so much you can do with this die. It's a really, really fun one. So once you've got those all set out, you can start the next process, which is the ironing process, which I do love. So I've got my pressing surface out ready, and I'm gonna lay my first blade down pretty side facing upwards. Okay, that's super important. And then what you're going to do is you're gonna fold your blade in half. Now I've got the fat end down this end on the right hand side and the thin end on the left. Doesn't matter which way around you do it, but um, we're really interested at this point in the fat end, the wider end, okay? So what we're gonna do is fold that blade in half and we can use our little notches to help us match up and make sure everything's beautifully lined up. And then we're just gonna press that in half. Now we don't need to press the whole way down the blade, okay? Halfway is plenty, okay? So that's just creating a fold down the center. And all you've got to do is repeat that process 20 times. So match up your notches and give it a little press. And at this stage, I want you to be nice and accurate with this process. So it's not something that you at home need to rush. Put the radio on or your favorite music and uh, a little bit of TV and then just carry on pressing all of those blades. And it's a good idea to get all of the blades pressed for one whole block before you get your sewing machine out because then you'll be able to just put your pedal to the metal and sew up all of your blades in one go which is always a fun process. So we'll keep going with this. Now Dresden plate blocks are a very traditional block. They've been around for ooh, well over a hundred years, um, but they're a design which still fascinate and inspire quilters in the 21st century. I think because it's such an adaptable shape and there's something about a circle, isn't there? That's so universal and so lasting. Um, quilts with circles in them always, always please me. So believe it or not, I'm almost done pressing 20 of these blades. It's definitely might be a time to put the kettle on and have a cup of tea. You could have tea while I'm doing this. Make me one if you want. Milk, no sugar. I saw a great mug once which had Pantone colors around it so you could specify the exact shade of tea you require because everyone likes different, don't they? There we go. Three left to go. It's a good way of uh, monitoring that you've cut the right number as well because you can have a little count up as you're going. Make sure you've got 20 for one Dresden plate. Okay, and that's it. That's that stage done. And we're ready to get to the sewing stage, which is great fun.
Okay, sewing machines at the ready. It's time to sew these blades up. So I have got my pile of blades all folded and pressed in half, right sides together. And again, I'm still just concerning myself with the wide end, that thick end that I have folded together and pressed. Okay, so what I've done, I've got my sewing machine ready with a quarter inch foot and just a neutral sewing thread, something grayish, dullish, brownish, something shadowy. And um, I'm gonna feed my blades through folded side first. In okay, case so the fold goes in first, and I'm just gonna lift up my presser foot, pop my blade underneath with the fold up against the needle and drop the presser foot back down. And I've got the raw edge of my fabric lined up with my presser foot. So I'm sewing a quarter of an inch across that folded edge. Now, rather than doing these one at a time, I've sewn one, and I'm gonna lift my presser foot, pop the next one under, folded side first, and keep sewing. Get the next one, presser foot up, and so, and just keep doing that. This is called chain piecing. It's gonna save a lot of thread, but it's also gonna save lots and lots of time, which means you can get to the really fun stuff. So here's my last one, number 20. So at this point, I can cut my thread and look, I've made, ooh, a hula skirt. <laughs> Now, next job is to cut these apart with a pair of scissors, just trim the thread in between all of those blades, all right? So we'll clip all of those apart. And then, this is where the magic happens. This is such a clever technique. What you need to do is grab hold of your blade, and you'll see at the moment it looks a little bit strange. It looks like sort of one end of a canoe. Um, and that edge that's folded and stitched, you're going to flick and sort of turn through to the right side. Now, next you need to grab something to push that point up. I'm using a little wooden satay skewer. Um, for this. You could use a chopstick, um, you could use a point turner if you've got one, um, but I'm more likely to have satay sticks or chopsticks in my house than a point turner. So, and if I put it down and lose it, it's no big deal. And pushing that up, can you see I now have the pointed end of my Dresden blade and if I turn this around so that you can see it from the back, what I'm doing is I'm centering that seam with the remainder of the folded center line. So you can use that as a guide. Um, and then just lightly finger press it in your hands just so that it knows which way it's going. And repeat 20 times. So just keep turning the points through and then pushing them gently out with that satay stick. Don't push too hard, otherwise you'll find the point of the stick pops through the top of the point. Um, so for that reason, I don't recommend that you use something like a pair of scissors to do this. Um, chopsticks are great, and satay sticks are really good too, because they don't have a particularly pointy end, but they will help you to create that pointed end to your Dresden blades. <laughs> So once you've done all that finger pressing and turning, you can give your blades a little press at your ironing board as well. Just make sure that that seam is lined up with the center crease, so you've got a nice straight point in the middle. Next thing, you need to set out your blades into your circle. So I've already started doing that. This is definitely the fun bit. Um, I've got my four different fabrics and I'm just setting these out, alternating the pinks and the blues. So I'm gonna keep going like that all the way around. Now for each full uh, Dresden plate, you're going to need 20 of these blades. 
And don't be surprised at this stage when you're setting them out if they don't necessarily make a circle or it kind of goes off a little bit. Don't worry about that. It will definitely go into a circle when you sew it together. Um, all you need to do at this stage is make sure that all your fabrics are in the right places. So we've just got the last four to go. Or five. Two. on and blue and pink and that's our 20 blades how pretty does that look just lovely so once you've got it set out like that it's not a bad idea if you've got a space on your table just to sort of slide it across so it stays in the order that you want to sew them together. I mean, if it's completely random, it doesn't matter. You could just pile them up or another way of getting random, if you don't do random and you find random hard, um, is to put all of your prepared blades into a box or into a bag and literally just reach in and whichever one you grab, that's the next one you sew. And um, it's quite hard to do that. <laughs> you have to really force yourself. But I want mine in a set pattern. So I'm going to just slide all of those across very carefully and bring my sewing machine in front of me. And then I can get to the sewing. Now I have kept my quarter of an inch foot attached to my machine, normal stitch length. And so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to start sewing these blades together in pairs. Now, when you put your first two together, obviously you've got your little notches that you can match up. And you also want to make sure that that folded end, that pointed end is also matched up. Most of the time, you're gonna find that the other end just matches up beautifully anyway. But if there is a very, very slight variation, it doesn't matter because that very inner center of your block is gonna be covered with the circle. It's more important that your pointed ends match up. So do spend just a moment matching those up. Now, if you want to, you can grab a pin and pop a pin in or you can just hold them together. It's quite a short seam, so you don't have to worry too much. So we're gonna pop that underneath our sewing machine, and I want you to make sure that you start at the folded end, at the pointed end, on every single one of these as you're sewing these blades together. And there's a very specific reason, which I'll explain in just a second. So what we're going to do is we're gonna hold on to our threads and start stitching. We're gonna do maybe three or four stitches. And then we're gonna hold down the reverse sewing button on our machine and we're gonna sew backwards, back off where we started. And then we're gonna start sewing forwards again. Make sure that you remove the pin. So essentially, we're reinforcing our seam allowance along that folded edge. Now, the very first time you make one of these Dresden plate blocks, I want you to just sew two of your patches together like that. And then I want you to stop. I want you to open up your seam allowance. Normally, when we press our patchwork, we press our seam allowances to one side or to the other side. But um, this is one occasion when I'd like you to press your seams open like that. It just helps to reduce the bulk because we've already got a little bit of bulk at the points because of the folding of the fabric. And we want to even out any bulk there by pressing our seam open. So finger press it open first of all, and then just run your iron down the seam itself and press it so it's nice and flat, beautiful and accurate. And then once you've done that, place them back where they came from. I'm a great one for chain piecing, but there are times when it is not worth getting into a muddle, and this is one of them. So I'm just gonna pick these up one pair at a time, always start at the folded end, and sew forward and reverse, and then just keep going.
Now I've leapt a little way ahead and sewn together all of my blades into pairs. I've still got them laying out on the table so I can keep a track of where everything is and make sure that everything's in the right place. And certainly for the first block, maybe even all of the blocks for a whole quilt, it's worth doing this stage one step at a time. Once you've got them all set out on the table, then we can start picking them up and sewing them together into fours. So exactly the same process. Make sure that you line up your notches. Always start at the folded edge and sew forward and reverse just to reinforce that seam and then keep sewing. Now obviously we're using a quarter of an inch seam allowance here and we're making a circle 360 degrees, 360 degrees where there is the potential to be a degree off or a degree over and it doesn't matter. As long as when you um, do your pressing, you know, you can make these little adjustments, you know, because your seam allowance only has to be a thread generous and, um, you know, it will make a difference, but it's not a problem. It's not a problem at all. So I'm just sewing these into fours now and I'll lay them back down on the table. That's a great visual there to remind me where everything goes and to make sure that I'm getting everything stitched together in the right order. There we go, that's three lots of four, so I've done 12. These Dresden plates really don't take a lot of time to sew together. And there's such a great effect. Now on your die, you've also got instructions for how to make the rounded end Dresden plate, which is really fun. And as I mentioned at the start of the classroom, if you want to, you can also combine the pointed end and the rounded end together. So you can alternate those on a block and that looks fantastic too. So many different options. So this is the last set of four going together. And one thing I am going to just leave till the very end now is the pressing. So I press the pairs open, but I'm leaving the pressing of the whole Dresden plate now until the whole thing's put together. So now all I've got to do is sew these five sections together. So literally again, flip two lots of four together match up the folded end and that handy little notch. So forward and reverse and all the way off the end. I'm using my fabric scissors here to cut my thread, which is naughty. There's nothing like thread for blunting your scissors. So it's quite a good idea to have a pair of thread snips next to your sewing machine. This is a classic case of do as I say, not as you see me doing. <laughs> but you know what it's like, it doesn't matter how brightly coloured scissors or thread snips are, I still manage to put them down and lose them. Okay, so I've done my two lots of eight. Uh, so now I've got one lot of four left on its own, so I can stitch that to one of the eights. And we're almost done. This is very exciting. Just make sure as you're sewing that you're keeping the rest of the Dresden plate out of the way and you're not stitching through all your layers. So here's the last little section going on and we've just two seams to sew this together. So we'll attach that fifth circle or fifth part circle. All right, and clip threads. And then the very last bit is just to sew these two ends together. So again, just bring those edges and line everything up. Back under the machine and sew forward and reverse. And that is all done. And there's my Dresden plate 
I mean, not far off being finished. All I need to do now is press all of those seam allowances open, just as I did right at the start with the pairs. So that's my next step. So again, I've got my handy little pressing mat here. I actually made this pressing mat myself. They're very, very easy to do. Um, this would be a top tip, I think it's fair to say. A piece of plasterboard, just cut into a decent sized rectangle. This one's about eight inches by about 20 inches. And then I've used a scrap of quilt batting, just a piece of quilt batting, and I have spray glued it to the top of my fiber board, pulled it round to the back, and then used a staple gun just to staple the batting to the back. Once that was all in place and nice and smooth, and you wanna make sure there's no wrinkles, make sure it's smooth and tight, um, it's just simply to, to wrap a piece of fabric over the top. And cotton is good, linen is even better, because linen fabric will actually take a higher heat setting on your iron, I mean, really sort of scorchingly hot. Um, without burning. So if you can get hold of some linen, that's even better. But quilt weight cotton is absolutely fine. And you could do a cutting mat to match your sewing room, perhaps. So a couple more seams just to press open. And it really is worth pushing these open with your fingers before you try and glide an iron down them. It makes the job a lot easier. So just open up that seam with your fingers. This actually is another time when you could use that wooden satay skewer just to help you open up the seam. So if you're struggling to get those two seams apart, you could just use your satay skewer and then press with the blunt end of that skewer. And it's really almost like you've pressed it with an iron. Very, very quick and easy to do. I'm on the last seam pressed open and then quickly flip it over and just press it down. Now this is where we want to try and get it as flat as possible and this is where we can make just little minor adjustments and if we need to make any little tiny tucks or pleats with our fabric, just make sure they're very, very close to the center because they'll be covered up with the circle. So there we've got our Dresden plate, all nicely pressed and it's pretty flat. While I've still got my sewing machine out, I'm gonna deal with that circular center. Now, if you remember right back to the start, of the classroom, I told you that you would need to cut two circles for a very specific reason. You're gonna put those two circles together, right side to right side, pretty side to pretty side. And we'll grab a couple of pins and we'll just pin everything together so that nothing moves while we're sewing. I've still got the quarter inch foot on my machine and I'm going to sew all the way around the circle. And I'm not going to leave a gap or anything like that. I'm just gonna sew all the way around the edge. Now, when you're sewing a circle, it's not a bad idea to reduce your stitch length. Remember, your sewing machine can't sew a curved stitch. It can only sew straight stitches. So if we're gonna get a nice smooth curve, the shorter the stitch is, the easier it is to get a nice circle. Another tip when you're sewing circles is not to pivot with the sewing stopped. You wanna actually move your fabric as you're sewing. You'll get a much, much smoother curve. So don't run your machine too fast or you'll run away with yourself. Just kind of take your time, run it fairly slowly and pivot your work as you're sewing, and then you'll get a really, really nice smooth curve, particularly if you use that shorter stitch length. Now what I'm doing here is what we call faced applique. I've gone all the way round that circle from start to finish. I've even done a little tiny overlap. It's almost like making a little cushion cover. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm going to carefully pull my two circles apart. 
Now, one of them is going to get snipped into, and that's the one that's going to be on the underside. Now, you could use one piece of fabric and one piece of lightweight interfacing, or you could even use a bit of scrap fabric, so long as it was something that isn't going to show through. I'm just putting the tip of my scissors into that little snip, and then I'm cutting across into the back of the circle. Make sure, please, that you don't cut through both circles when you're doing this. You're only cutting through the one at the back. So you can see now I have opened up that back circle. All right, another thing that I'm going to do while I've still got it turned through to the wrong side is I'm just going to clip into my seam allowance about every quarter of an inch. Now, you could use pinking shears to do this. What pinking shears will do is actually cut notches out of the seam allowance, which will give an even better turned finish. But if you haven't got uh, any pinking shears, then a pair of scissors is fine. And you just want to make little snips into your seam allowance. I'm going about ooh, an eighth of an inch in, so not as far as my actual sewn seam. If you snip too far, you'll end up cutting through your seam allowance and um, you'll have to start again. So don't do that. And once you get back to where you started, which I am there just about now, we need to go back to the satay stick. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn the circle through to the right side through that opening. Okay. So turn it right through to the right side. And by sewing that seam, what it's doing is actually turning the raw edges inside. I mean, it really is like making a little, little round cushion, I suppose. And then I'm going to start by just using my finger to push the seam allowance nice and smooth and flat. OK, so once you've done that, you can then get your satay stick or your chopstick or your point turner and then run that around the inside. What this is doing is it's just helping to smooth out that curve. Now, one of the benefits of using the same fabric on the front and the back is if you don't do this turning process absolutely perfectly, it won't matter because you won't see, you know, if you see any of the back fabric from the front, it's the same fabric, so it doesn't matter. If you use white fabric or you use interfacing and it shows on the front, well, it's really going to show then. But, um, you know, fabric is precious. And if you don't want to use a second piece of fabric, just use a bit of scrap. Just make sure it's something that won't show through. OK, I think that's pretty much done. And I've got a really nicely turned circle there. And the last thing that you need to do is just go to your iron and then just press that flat. So now we've got a beautifully turned circle that is going to go over the hole in the center and that will be appliqued in place. So we've got our Dresden plate all prepared. I've also done the circle. Now, if you're just making a Dresden plate, all you need to do now is applique that to a background square, which I will show you how to do. But um, I mentioned right at the start that on my cushion, I have included some extra little embellishments here. I've added some little folded squares. And I just want to show you quickly how I did that. OK, so I'll pop that to one side for a second. Now, what I did was I used my eight inch cube and I used uh, die number two, which is the small squares. Now, in your eight inch cube, this cuts two and a half inch squares. But if you've also got the value die, you've got the two and a half inch square on that. So um, it doesn't matter whether you've got the eight inch cube or the value die. Um, if you didn't have either of them, you could use a different size square, as long as it's a fairly small square and you're going to cut out some squares. <laughs> So I've used my value die, or you could use your eight inch cube to cut some two and a half inch squares. 
You could even use your strip die for that. And there's so many different ways to cut a two and a half inch square using your AccuQuilt dies. And then I've got it down on my pressing surface. Now at the moment it's pretty side up. I'm just gonna flip it over and I'm gonna set it so it's like a diamond, like a square on point. Okay, so what you're gonna do first of all is fold that square in half on the diagonal to create a triangle, okay? Grab your iron and then just carefully press that in place. Okay, so once you've done that and you've got it pressed, turn it around so that folded pressed edge is near the top. Now it's quite a good idea to do this stage in a bunch because at the moment the fabric's quite hot and you'll be handling it. So if you do a few of these at a time and then go back to the first one, the fabric will have cooled and it'll be much more comfortable for you to handle. Okay, then what you're going to do is you're gonna bring these two outer points down to meet the bottom point, okay? So we'll just bring that outer point down and that outer point down and let them meet in the center. What we should end up with is a nice little folded square like that, okay? And one more little use for that satay stick, because this is quite a small thing to press, is just to hold that fabric in place with your satay stick and then put your iron on top. Then you can slip the satay stick out, nobody got burnt, the fabric stayed where it was supposed to, and we've got our little folded square all done, okay? So you're just gonna do a bunch of those like that, and then to finish off your cushion, all I did with these was tucked them. I did 10, but you could do 20. And I just tucked them behind every other point like this and pinned them in place. And then when I stitched the Dresden plate to the background, I caught the lower edge, the raw edge in as I applied the Dresden plate, which meant that the tip stayed proud and sort of three-dimensional. It's a really nice little added feature. You can also add these to things like the edges of quilts or around quilt blocks. Um, it's a really nice little touch, these little sort of prairie points. So the next stage that I'm gonna show you is how to applique your Dresden plate to your background and then add the circle to get that block finished. Now, once you've got your Dresden plate all nicely pressed and as flat as you can get it, it's time to put it onto your background square. Now, um, the background square that you're going to need, roughly 14 and a half, 15 inches. You can do a bigger square, it will just have more space around it. There are, of course, full instructions with your uh, die. What you want to do with that square is to lightly crease it into quarters. So fold it in half and in half again and just very, very lightly crease it to find the center points. Then what you can do is you can line up four points on your Dresden plate with those four creases and that way your Dresden plate will be absolutely centered. You can pin the Dresden plate in place, of course, and um, you know that's a, an easy enough process. But if time's short, or you want to sort of get a really, really nice flat finish, I love using 505 adhesive spray. Just give you background square, just a really light spritz, and then you can lay your Dresden plate on and press it down, and then the whole thing stays in place. There's no pins to worry about. You can get straight to the sewing. Okay, so whichever way you choose, make sure that your Dresden plate is really well secured down before you start sewing. Now there's various different options for sewing down the edges and you can refer to my classroom on applique for some different ideas. But my favorite way of attaching the Dresden plate is simply to use a straight stitch and sew very, very close to the edge. So what I've got is I've got it on a straight stitch. I'm using my normal quarter inch foot, but you could also use your um, open toed embroidery foot. Drop your needle down and then just take a stitch forward and back. 
just to reinforce the start. And then what we're doing is we're sewing as close to that edge as we can possibly get. So about an eighth of an inch in from the edge. If you've got a needle up, needle down function on your machine, set your needle to always finish in the down position. And then you'll be there ready to pivot every time you get to either the top point or the inner point. You know you've got to the inner point because that's where the two fabrics meet, where your two blades meet. So just keep turning it between those two points back and forth and it's not a slow job you'll have this done in no time now of course if you prefer you could pin or baste your dresden plate to your background and then you could hand applique the dresden plate so if you enjoy handwork that would be a nice opportunity to do some handwork if you wanted a more decorative finish, you could use a contrast thread and maybe even one of the decorative stitches on your sewing machine to add a really fancy finish to your Dresden plate. Now, right here, I'm using just a cream thread, but you could also try using something called invisible thread. Um, it's not a joke, um, or sometimes known as monofilament. Now, monofilament is, as the name suggests, a um, clear plastic thread. Um, it looks a little bit like fishing line, but make sure you get one which is really fine and really soft. Um, it's worth experimenting with a few different brands to find one that goes through your machine nicely and um, gives you a lovely finish. So um, that way you won't really see the sewing at all. Just use a normal thread in your bobbin if you're using invisible thread in the top. Don't use invisible thread in both the top and the bobbin. Your machine definitely won't like that. Okay, nearly there. Using that uh, basting spray is great as a way of just holding everything in place. It's like having a thousand pins and I haven't had to put any in or take any out. So that's the result where I come from. And we'll just keep sewing all the way around. If you were adding in those little folded squares, um, you would need to pin those in place as well and then you can attach everything in one go. Last few points. Who knew 20 points would take so long? It's not really that long at all, is it? There we go. I think I've got about four more to go. Again, if you want to put the kettle on. Mine's white with no sugar. My mum always laughs at me because she says I'm completely fueled by tea. It fuels my creativity because I'm never without a cup of tea. Apart from today. <laughs> when you get back to the start, I just want you to do that reinforcing one last time. And that's it. We're done. We're all sewn up. I can clip my threads. And there is my Dresden plate all attached. Now, the very last thing to do is just to cover that center hole, and that's what we made the circle for. Now, to help me place this, I've done exactly the same as I recommended you do with your background square. I've folded it in half and in half again and created some little creases. What I'm going to do now is just to um, line up those creases with some seams just to make sure that I've got this right slap bang in the center of my block, okay? Now you can either pin that in place, or again, you could use your basting spray, just a, just a very light little spritz, just underneath, just to hold it in place, or if you prefer a couple of pins, do exactly the same job. Okay, so that circle's in place. 
and then back under the machine and then I'm going to do exactly the same I'm going to use my straight stitch now if you wanted to if you wanted to ring the changes a little bit this would be a really nice opportunity to use a different stitch so something like a blanket stitch on your machine would look gorgeous you could also use something like um, a zigzag you could use a satin stitch but you could also use something like a feather stitch or a serpentine stitch would look absolutely gorgeous just experiment you know and the way to do that is just to get some scrap fabric and just have a little play as adults i don't think we spend nearly enough time playing when you think back to how much time you spent playing when you were a child and how much time you spend playing now that's why we need to craft and there we go that's the center of my dresden plate added and the block's finished sewn in real time right before your very eyes start to finish super easy super accurate and super fun because with accuquilt better cuts really do make better quilts <laughs> Now, one of the questions I get asked more than any other is, how am I going to quilt it? I always get asked, how am I going to quilt it? So I thought just to finish off this section on Dresden plate, we talk about different ways to quilt your Dresden plate. Now, the first thing is that with any kind of applique block, and this is effectively pieced and then it's applique to a background. The most important thing you can do to really create drama in your block is to outline quilt it. If you're going to do nothing else, make sure you outline quilt the block. So what do I mean by that? Well, we need to stitch very, very close to the edge of our block all the way around. Now, if you have a look at my quilting classroom on applique, I've described a technique there which I call applique-quilt whereby we layer our quilt block with our batting and then we applique and quilt in one step. And as we've stitched really, really close to the edge, that would suffice, two jobs for the price of one. But if you've done the traditional way and made your block separately, when you come to quilt it, definitely want to outline it. What you will notice when you do that and uh, quilt around the circle is you will suddenly see those elements will pop from the background it makes them stand out and that's what we want our appliques to do we want them to stand out the second thing that you can do to make appliques stand out is to quilt down the background so this is our negative space this is our background space in the background so i have quilted this quite heavily now on this cushion i've used what we call vermicelli or a meander quilting which is essentially like you know dumping a load of spaghetti on a plate and creates this sort of wiggly line the only difference is when you do vermicelli quilting you don't want the spaghetti to get into a tangle you want all of the individual lines and wiggles to stay separate um, fairly easy to do but sometimes it can get a little bit you know hard some people find it harder than others if you wanted to just do wiggly lines that cross over each other nothing wrong with that make up your own rules you don't have to follow the quilt police but densely quilting the background however you do it will again help to make that dresden plate block really pop from the surface so another thing that you could do if you wanted to quilt the actual blades you could quilt either in the line between the piecing that's hard i wouldn't do that easier much easier and more effective i think to stitch a little way outside of the lines this will help to mirror the stitching line that attaches the dresden plate to the background so about an eighth of an inch either side of your seam will look gorgeous but if you prefer free motion quilting like I do, you could easily quilt a kind of wiggly line that runs up and then back down, up and back down, or even like an elongated question mark. So coming up and spiral and back and then quilt around the circle and then back up and around 
and back down. That would also look great. Just a little tip, if you're doing a quilting design that sort of all faces one way, when you get to about here, it's really worth turning your block so that it's easy to keep those spirals going the same way. Or trust me, nine times out of 10, you get down to here and your brain will flip and you'll start doing the spirals going the other way. So although I don't like turning my quilts when I'm quilting them, that is definitely one time when I will turn my quilt. So remember, for all these hints and tips to help you to get the most from your AccuQuilt system, it's really worth subscribing to our YouTube channel so that you'll be informed as soon as a new quilting classroom is put onto air. So please join me next time for another quilting classroom with Create and Craft and AccuQuilt. And remember, better cuts make better quilts. See you next time. Thank you.